One of the biggest relaxation practices that we're doing every single day is 61 point relaxation. 61 point relaxation, in my opinion, is actually an advanced pranayama practice. And some of that will become clearer as I talk more in this conversation about what pranayama is, but I just want you to put a pin in that for now. That, that is a very powerful practice that Karina and I teach almost religiously. Um, I teach it, I introduced it this 300, but I typically teach it, I always teach it in 200, 200 hour. But it is an advanced pranayama practice. And I'm gonna just put a pin in that for now and then come back. And, and to say that there is this huge link between pranayama and relaxation, that the two really are inseparable. A lot of you, when I say you, I'm talking about the big you. <laughs> A lot of you, when I say pranayama or when some teacher says pranayama, probably the first thing to come to your mind is breathing. And this is a very layman's ignorant point of view of pranayama. And, and of course it is ignorant because you just don't know what you don't know, ergo a video. <laughs> you have a video. <laughs> but it is, it's, if you ask a hundred people what pranayama is, you'll probably get back 99 responses. It's breathing practices. And pranayama is so much more than this. Um, it's your connection to the universe. It's your connection to life force energy. It's your connection to everything. <laughs> and as we were dancing around today, you know, dance is a form of pranayama practice. It's a form of awakening that energy. In our tradition, in the tradition of, of Tantra, we relate to pranayama as our connection to the divine goddess. It's our direct link to her. To being able to be fully embraced by her. And as we practice pranayama, if we practice it with that sense of devotion, that sense of, of yearning to be connected, it increases the potency of it so much more. It becomes something so different. There's so much to talk about. <laughs> There's so much to talk about. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> I haven't given this talk in two and a half years. It's not something I really talk about that often, but when I do, it's there's a lot to unpack here. And in so, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about or I'm going to convey is kind of very esoteric on one hand, and on the other hand, it's very practical. Um, kind of stuff. Prana in and of itself, the definition or the word prana means to animate. That which animates. Very simple. And you think about, you know, I just said earlier that when we practice pranayama, it's our way to connect with her. It's a way to animate your relationship with her. <laughs> and as you practice pranayama, she starts to come out and she starts to flow. It was really interesting because I came in, you know, I've been really struggling with focus the last couple of weeks. I've been really burnt out. Not from teaching, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I could be in my most burnt out state and then come into class and I'm like, it all comes through me. But I've been just so burnt out from my work. I've been carrying so much the last eight months, um, trying to keep this place alive, you know, just, I don't need to give you the laundry list, but it's just, I just don't, I want to take my computer and throw it into the ocean right now and <laughs> do it, do it. And 
And so there's a big part of me that's just was so burnt out. I came in here, I heard the music in my, you know, it was like, oh, that's so beautiful. But I just heard the music and there was like, you know, it was like the Kali was behind me, pushing me out the door. I don't know if you noticed, I came sort of running in. <laughs> and after that, I went back to my work and I just banged out all of this stuff I've been putting off for three days. And there was that level of focus and intentionality. That is an aspect of pranayama. That is when you are really aligned with what the potential of what prana can be, it just starts to channel through you and everything becomes aligned and your whole life starts to become animated. The seat you know, I was just talking about my burnout and the burnout is this lack of prana. I haven't been able to fill my cup, you know, and it sounds so simple or, or, you know, like everybody needs to fill their cup. And that is like part of an aspect of pranayama is filling your own cup up, um, doing self spa days or, taking time for yourself um, to, but it's not just like, it's, it shouldn't be forced either, but it's doing those things where you honor the creative part of yourself. Again, the creative part of yourself is that connection to the Divine Mother. That when we are in that flow with her, our life just starts to move more seamlessly, more effortlessly, more joyfully. And I have not been, I've been happy, don't get me wrong, I'm not this miserable person at Lulosa, <laughs> very happy person, but there is this kind of like, like, ugh, I have to go deal with this stuff. Yeah, I have to deal with this. And anyway, when I was dancing with you fabulous yogini dancers, <laughs> We have the Rockettes, we have the Yoginets. <laughs> that, that joy just really started to come back and I was like, oh my God, this is what I've been missing. Um, so pranayama, prana means to that which animates and that which brings to life. And I, I hope I don't trigger anybody by this example, but for me, this is a very clear cut example of you know, we, you've, we've all had pets. In one minute, when the pet is alive, it's sparky. You know, I had this Pete's brother, Steve, who um, passed away about a year before you were here. And I remember watching, because they actually rushed him off to the vet. Um, we knew there was a problem. They rushed him to the vet, and then they brought him back, and Pete, Steve was gone. Their body was there, but Steve was gone. What was gone? The prana, the animation. The soul had left, and the soul in our tradition, it said that the soul is what breathes life, what gives life to an object. It's interesting, because in the Bible, it says, what does it say? God took some clay, formed a body, and then what did he do? He breathed life into it. He breathed on it, and then Adam came to life. There's that connection between, you know, prana is that connection between spirit and the physical. It's that link. It's that which connects us to um, the divine. And, of course, we've been talking about the goddess, so it's that which connects us to her. That which, which connects or strengthens our bond to her. So that's a little bit of idea about the word prana. And the word yama is really important to understand. So we see this word yama come up. Where do we see it? Yamas. Yamas and niyamas. And what anybody remember what the word yama means? Sorry? 
stuff you do want to do. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> stuff you do. I don't know. <laughs> restrictions. That's a good word. Restrictions. Rules. Rules. Control. Control. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The One of the best words I like to describe yama is restraint. To restrain from. To to restrain from something. There are, you know, it can be translated as rules. I don't like that word too much, rules. Um, it, but also control, discipline, yeah, discipline, but discipline, yet, in the, in the way that I'm about to describe restraint, it, it, discipline definitely is a big part of it. And so while we're on that thread, what is another word or what is a Sanskrit word for discipline? which I've talked about a lot, tapas, tapas. And so I had this, I had this one teacher for a while, his name was Rudy Ballantyne, and he was a direct student of Swami Rama. Rudy never um, kept his position at the Himalayan Institute. They kind of, kind of got pushed out, but that's, um, but that was actually a great thing because then it got Rudy to go do the work he was really meant to do. And um, so Rudy was my teacher for a while. It was really fascinating having him as a teacher. He's the author of a very popular um, book called Radical Health, just FYI. Um, and so I, I started working with Rudy privately for a period of time. And I started working with him just because I was having a lot of issues in my body uh, for a while. And I was having pain, and I just couldn't figure out the source of it. And so my friend Rick said, you know, you should work with Rudy. And I went, oh, okay. So we started working together. And I remember my first session, Rudy came over, and we had this conversation. And I kind of just vomited all over him, telling him everything that was wrong in my life and that was going on and why I was in pain. And he turned to me. <laughs> after I had finished and said, she's really pissed with you. <laughs> I was, he was talking about her, the divine goddess, the divine mother. She's really pissed with you. And that's why you're in pain. You're not flowing with her very well. <laughs> I was, yeah, that's what I did. I was like, <laughs> Oh yeah, like it just all of a sudden made a lot of sense. And so there was something, there was a conversation I had with him one day. We were talking about pranayama and I was asking him a bunch of questions. And it was really cool working with Ra with Al, um, Ruby. Ruby, thank you. <laughs> but it was also cool working with Alan because both of those men brought a very, <laughs> if you knew Alan, you would understand the statement. They really brought a feminine aspect to these teachings that we often don't see in the yoga world. Even a lot of female teachers don't really bring a feminine aspect. They've been, you know, patriarchalized, <laughs> is that a word? <laughs> in the way that they present, you don't really see people genuinely bringing a feminine aspect to these teachings, a knowledgeable feminine aspect to these teachings. It's not there, you really have to dig for it. And so Rudy really did that for me. He really brought this whole feminine side to these teachings. You know, both Karina and I talk about our teacher lovingly, Rod Stryker, um, who's very masculine. <laughs> extremely masculine <laughs> and but Alan and, and Rudy both brought these very feminine sides to these teachings and one day I was asking Rudy a bunch of questions and I don't remember what one of the questions was but then we started talking about pranayama and I and then and then he said well what do you think yama means and I said to him I said well it usually means control he says, what's another word they use? And I said, restraint. And to restrain prana, he says, what are you doing when you restrain something? I said, well, you're, 
putting a container around it. He says, and that's what toughness is, is you're creating a container around this energy. And as I was watching us dancing today, what kept going through my mind was, and, and even you guys at home, was here we were creating this energy in this room with you, you guys here, and what started happening in that energy was this, this birthing of something. This, this contained space, this yama, to the point where people had came out of their work because they were like, what the hell is going on? All of Blue Osa was starting to come in. I didn't, we didn't know this, but they were like trying to peek in and what's going on up there? Because they could feel the energy. And they weren't, they weren't like ready for it. They didn't know what was going on, but it started causing this unrest because they weren't part of this space. They weren't part of our yama. You know, Kaylee, as you were talking about your, um, your activity ritual that you created, what kept going through my mind was this space, this yama that you created and and how important that is. And, and one of the things that Kaylee said, which I thought was very, um, poignant, was that she had no expectation. She had intention, you know, of a purpose. She had, you know, um, thoughts that went into this ritual. But she didn't have an intent, like she didn't, sorry, she didn't have an expectation of what was going to happen. And, and, but she had this yama. And it's important to distinguish this because one of the most perverted definitions of pranayama out there is breath control. Does anything that we did in this room at that dance sound control to you? No. There was no control. I, there wasn't, I did not lasso your neck with a piece of rope and start commanding you to dance. We just said, let's dance. But that is the idea of what happens a lot in this sort of patriarchal view of the way that yoga is taught is that you have to control something. You have to control her and whip her into submission. And this is the complete opposite of what this teaching is really trying to impart to you. That it's really about this idea of creating and holding a space for her to become alive. You know, I know this is going to sound corny and I probably will lose your respect, but you know those memes that used to go around with Ryan Gosling? Like, hey baby, I've got enough space to hold you and all of, you know, that's Yama. That is the personification of Yama. I love those things. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> Hey girl, I've got, you know, I'm holding on to all of you. <laughs> but that's Yama. It's like, you know, your, but the other part of that though is how much can you hold on to that space? You know, how much can you increase your capacity to hold more space or to hold more energy? So those two things are hand in hand. Yes. You want her to come alive, but can you deal with it? Are you ready for her? <laughs> I almost feel like the definition then would be that which restrains in order to channel, like a focus. See, I don't, I don't use the word restraint anymore. Um, I don't, I just don't use it. Um, you can call it a container, you know, because that's, that is actually the point that I'm trying to get to is that yama 
in and of itself is a container that's synonymous with this word tapas. Tapas in and of itself, think of the mortar and the pestle. And so you're grinding it down, you know, you're churning it. One of, you know, Stephanie, one of my favorite um, analogies is the witch and the cauldron, you know. And um, Karina talked to you yet about the witch's cauldron? No, you guys are in magic school if you didn't know that. <laughs> and so what are we... Oh, Karina hasn't said that yet. But you guys are in magic school. And what you're doing is you have this big cauldron and every yoga class is a cauldron in the space. The cauldron is the yoga class. And what we do is we throw in a little bit of maybe some twists, maybe some laterals, maybe one forward bend and three back bends. We throw in some um, uh, mudras and maybe we throw in some intention and then what is the one of the final things we throw in? Some mantra. <laughs> and then we start stirring it. And we breathe over that cauldron. And I always love in Disney when they, you know, the, the archetypal witch is like doing her mantra, you know. Um, one of my favorite depictions is Angelina Jolie in, in uh, Maleficent. And she's doing that. Ch um, chanting and she's stirring it and then you know in true to Disney form you can see the spell coming out of the cauldron and going to where it needs to go that's what we're doing in yoga <laughs> is we're creating these spells and all of this is taking place in this container so one of the best I think one of the best ideas for me is is this idea of a container, but one of the words that Rudy used was dam. A yama is also like a dam in a river that's flowing. That river is flowing, what we're doing is we're putting a dam up. What is the dam doing? It's stopping the flow and it's building up building up and we're holding on to it. We're containing that energy. And that's also a very important idea. But one of the reasons why there's so much um, caution in the teachings about having a teacher as you do these practices is because sometimes some of us aren't ready to deal with that energy that's backed up. We're not ready to deal with holding on to that much energy. If we don't have strong intention in where we're going to direct that energy to once we start to lift that dam up, then it will just go out into all of our dysfunctionalities. Rod used to say that we can practice pranayama but if you're, you know, if you're a person that has strong intention, you have strong purpose, then that prana will go to that strong purpose and intention. But if you're a person that's really dysfunctional, then all of that prana will go to your dysfunctions. So if you practice pranayama and you're an angry person, then you ultimately become powerfully angry. If you're a joyful person and you practice pranayama, then you become powerfully joyful. You have a question? Well, you're angry, how can you change it? So in that context of what you just said, if you know that you feel angry versus joyful, then how do you make that shift so that you're building the right life force in the practice? It's not, it's not, no, there's, so the question was, is it, if you know that you've got these tendencies, how do you build the right life force? The prana is the prana is the prana. <laughs> and the prana is not good or bad the energy is not good or bad it's just <clears throat> it's just think about like what happens um, if you're building up uh, if you're holding you know if you if you build a dam and that water has got to go somewhere 
you don't have a canal or some channel for that water to go down, it's just gonna go everywhere. And so we need to start building our own canals in our minds. And what those are called is samskaras. It start to create healthy samskaras in your life so that when you start to build energy, those samskaras, the healthy ones, <laughs> the good ones, are going to become more fortified, more stronger. This is a very abstract topic. I, very... I'm, in, I'm enjoying it very much. I was thinking to the other day when when one of I was thinking about the other day when Brittany asked us to journal about what is a leader, and one of the things that I wrote was that a leader is someone who can hold everything you give them, everything you that that gets conjured up in working. That, and that's sort of what I carried with me that day, is that I, I can hold anything you give me. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. No, that's, I mean, that's, that is the definition of Yama. And Karina's and my role during your trainings is to be that Yama for you, is to hold space for you and Brittany, to hold space for you guys to to explore and to become that which you are meant to be in a safe, you know, in a safe environment. And that is, that is ultimately the role of a yoga teacher, but I think to really embody that is the role of leadership. Is to allow people the space to become who they're meant to be. This idea, um, Stephanie, of, you know, building prana, I, you know, I can kind of illustrate it two different ways. Um, actually, I can just illustrate it a few different ways, but two that, well, there's three that came to mind, but one I've, I've told that story too many times, so I'll tell you another story. That when I was in my early 20s, well, mid-20s, and I was really starting to become a yoga teacher in Vancouver, and uh, <laughs> I was still finding out what it was to mean to be a yogi, let alone a yoga teacher. So put that in context. I was just all about the workout and what it was supposed to be about. But I remember I got this gig teaching in this gym and it was at, I got the, this class, it was 9.15 at night. So I know. <laughs> but I would teach this very high energy yoga class. I did everything wrong. I did all the things you're not supposed to do. And I used to teach this high energy yoga class. And I had this friend named Christopher, and he used to start coming with me to this class. He would take the class. And then we would go and we would do this class. And then um, it was 10.15 at night. I usually went over, so it was actually 9. 10.30 by the time we finished. We would go take a shower, we would leave, and we were just like so jacked up, you know? And I was I was the kind of teacher back then, I would actually do the class with them. Well, I wouldn't just mouth it, I would actually do it. And uh, so we were both jacked up, full of prana, feeling good. Aaron, what do you want to do? Let's go for a beer. <laughs> and there was this up this gay bar that we used to love going to in Vancouver. And so we would go for a beer. Four o'clock in the morning, we were looking for a McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> so we had all that energy with all that prana. So Stephanie, it's not like good or bad energy, it's just the energy is gonna go where it's gonna go. And so another example is the one I just gave that I came up here and participated with you guys. I got my prana like completely alive and went back to my room and focused it on getting my tasks done, the things that I needed to get done. That is like what we're trying to do and, and teach you guys to do is to start directing your energy, your prana to that which you really want to direct your prana to. Because the Energy is energy, and it's going to go somewhere. Do you want it to go to things 
that are temporary and won't really ultimately do anything for you? Or do you want to direct it towards your practice, towards fulfilling your purpose, towards things that are really meaningful to you? <clears throat> do you guys have any questions online? No? Okay. So, <clears throat> One of the things that we're doing, Stephanie, and this is why I like the teachings of embracing the teachings of the sutra so much, is because what Patanjali is doing ultimately is asking us to get to work on identifying what those unconstructive um, samskaras are and start replacing them with more healthy Samskaras. We have to do that work, you know, and I think that's the essential piece of the art of living joyful. Yes, that's the whole point of the art of joyful living. That's why Rama is asking you to do is start identifying, get to work and identifying your destructive habit patterns, those things that are not serving you. It's the whole point of that book. That's why it's in the Um, it can be so hard to say goodbye to. Oh, yeah. It can be really hard to say goodbye to. I mean, I love going out, but you know, it is hard to do it. And I think that we kind of have to balance two things. There's two things that we're kind of balancing, you know, and I would say this is a general rule in yoga, period. But in a personal practice, it's also something to be really mindful of that the more that I go deeper into these practices, the things that I thought were important are no longer important to me. Um, the, the cravings that I had are starting to dissipate. They're starting to go away. And potentially, and this is kind of, kind of leading into the scriptural reference part of this talk, that he gets into this whole section in um, in Abhyasan Varagya, so we see that right away in Sutra 112. He talks about this idea of Abhyasan Varagya, that we need to start cultivating a practice. And then also simultaneously practice on attachment. The part about non-attachment is not part of today's talk, so I don't want to go down that path. But the part about abhyasa is really important. And when I got this book, this is the book called The Secret of the Yoga Sutras. <laughs> Can you, <wait? laughs> you got your book, The Secret of the Yoga Sutras. Um, and this is the first pada, the first chapter. And nobody really broke it down for me until I picked up this book. And then it started to make a lot more sense. So let's kind of give the generic idea of what abhyasa is. Abhyasa, generally speaking, means, if you're going to ask a typical yoga teacher what abhyasa means, they would say practice. Do your practice. Practice, practice, practice. That sounds really boring. <laughs> Just practice. Do your practice. Shut up and practice. Stop crying, do your practice. You know, do your practice. Very patriarchal point of view, by the way. Man up, do your practice. Man up, do your practice. It's a very, it is, it's very patriarchal. Can you spell Abhyasa? Sure. A-B-H-Y-A-S-A. Thank you. So Abhyasa, question was, how do you spell Abhyasa? A B H. Y-A-S-A. Avi. Avi Asa. Avi Asa. I can hear Karina. Avi Asa. <laughs> and, but what Avi Asa means, you know, what it, 
for me, I always heard this idea of practice, practice, practice. And then in the four chapters on freedom, which is one of the books that we tell people to get for alternative books for the 200 hour, it says to be in the endeavor of. So to be in the endeavor of achieving that state, to be in the endeavor of working towards achieving yoga. Sorry? It's a quest. It's a quest. It's a quest to achieve yoga. Yeah, it's a quest. You know, join Sir Lancelot on a quest <laughs> to find yoga. <laughs> but, it's, but it doesn't have a destination. It doesn't have a destination. Patanjali kind of never really... I mean, in some ways, yeah, there is a destination. The destination is samadhi. But I think it was in Sutra 118. Could be wrong. I think it's Sutra 118, 17. He says, the goal is samadhi. So this is where we're going. But on the route to samadhi, you're going to have a lot of stops along the way. So he reminds us to enjoy the stops. You know, if you're going from New York to L.A., you know, you might nip down to Florida first, maybe even Costa Rica. <laughs> it's a little out of the way, but who cares? Um, <laughs> uh, you can have stops along the way, but as you go to each of those stops, you have different experiences of the final destination. You know, you can, you can go to Florida and have some joy. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on what point of Florida. <laughs> you can always go to Key West. My, my business partner just sold his place. And um, after a year of trying to sell his place and going through like about 10 people saying that they were going to buy it and then backing out. And he's been on this emotional roller coaster for the last year, at, you know, along with everything else going on. And he says, I just want to check out for the next couple of weeks. And I said, go and do that. You deserve it. And he says, I just want to find a place in the keys on the beach with my sister and my dog, Peggy. <laughs> and um, so you can, ha you can go do that in the keys and still have an experience of the final samadhi. Um, but... This idea of, of Abhyasa goes a little bit deeper, and I want to read to you um, Patanjali, sorry, I want to read to you PRT's exact definition of Abhyasa, because it's really a beautiful definition. And so write it down if you would like to. It means um, an ardent effort. To retain the peaceful flow of mind. Now, before I give the rest of the definition, I'm not finished yet. But when I give the rest of the definition, I want you to kind of understand something. When he says flow of mind, he's talking about samskara. In, in essence, he's talking about samskara. He's talking about creating a samskara in the mind. What is one of the words that is synonymous with samskaras? Habit pattern. To create a habit pattern, a deep habit pattern in the mind. A flow of mind is synonymous with this idea of, of samskara. So an ardent effort to retain, again, there's that word retain, there's another word which is learning, yama, Yama yama, yama yama. <laughs> to re an ardent effort to retain the peaceful flow of mind free of roaming tendencies. An ardent effort to retain the peaceful flow of mind free of roaming tendencies. That your mind is flowing peacefully inward without Distraction. And it was actually kind of cool because when I was dancing with you guys today, completely forgot about all I had to do. 
It was bliss. And actually, I looked at the timestamp, by the way. We danced for almost 30 minutes. It was like a 30 minute dance. Makes me feel slightly better. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was 10. <laughs> it was 10. That was party over the day. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank are the mind's inherent capacities. Its basic function is to illuminate the objects of the senses and present sensory experiences to fulfill the purpose of consciousness within. Those of you who remember, if you can go back that far, um, Angela, I'm sorry you haven't had this experience. But <laughs> we'll remember, what do we do in teacher training in 200 hour? We do the meditation on the witness to start establishing witness awareness. We distinguish, you know, sound, the feeling of the skin. We start watching our thoughts and then we start to tune into what is that consciousness watching our thoughts? What is that consciousness feeling the skin? That's what he's talking about here is that there's consciousness that's watching the flame. You mean what I just read? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll say it again. Samadhi is the mind's natural state. Illumination and stability are its intrinsic virtues. The power to move and the power to flow are the mind's inherent capacities. Just going to pause there before I continue and just remind you guys of an important thing. This is why I use the river analogy so much. The mind is like a river. It's flowing all the time. And the two, Patanjali says that the two aspects of mind is chitta, consciousness, and prana. He also says the death of one is the death of the other, which I'll come back to. But the mind is constantly flowing. And what we're wanting to do is stop, or temporarily stop that flow for a moment. Because if we can stop that flow, then the idea is then we can stop thought. Thoughts will start, stop to, start to cease. Its basic function the basic function of the mind is to illuminate the objects of the senses and present sensory experiences to fulfill the purpose of consciousness with him. Yes, <laughs> I'm still on 112. At the very, sorry, I'm not on 112. I apologize. I'm on 113. 113 is the definition of avyasa. A stable, I apologize, Lisa, okay. a stable, transparent mind perceives its object without distortion. Let me read that one more time because that's a loaded freaking statement. <laughs> a stable, transparent mind, a stable, transparent mind perceives its object without distortion and presents objective experience to consciousness without adding its own interpretation. This is the power of Tratika. This is why I always say incessantly Tratika is the, one of the most powerful practices that we can do in yoga. For 10 minutes, your practice is just to watch the flame without having any distraction or any thoughts coming between you and the flame. The problem most of us face is that the layers of highly potent samskaras known as vasanas are blocking the mind's transparency and suppressing its stability. The nature of mind is stable, but because of these vasanas, they're blocking the mind's transparencies and suppressing its stability, causing it to seek reasons to be disturbed and distracted. 
Due to these vasanas, the mind has acquired a taste for these mental states and is thus drawn to disturbing, stupefying, and distracting thoughts. I also want to add confusing. Confusing and distracting thoughts and objectives. And so our goal in our practice is to begin to bring luminosity back to the mind. The goal of yoga is to bring luminosity. And you see this happen even, Stephanie, in Bikram yoga. <laughs> even, Nicole, in Ashtanga yoga. No, I, I, that's because it's I... That's, luminosity, it's called sweat. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is a spark of something that happens when people start moving the body and breathing. There is something that starts happening. Endorphins definitely. Yeah, there is definitely lots of endorphins, but there's also something that happens. As soon as you ask people to breathe, even if it's just for a moment, there's something that's gonna start happening. Consciousness will awaken, even if it's in the glimmer of a moment, but it is in that glimmer of the moment that sometimes some people wake up and go, there has to be something else. You know, Nicole, you were sharing that it was very poignant what you said because you said like, oh, everything you've done has prepared you for getting here. It's true. You know, and so it, you know, Rod always says that students need to be ripened. You needed to go through a ripening. Know, to get here and then you come here and it's like oh yeah that makes sense now. I can hear that um, we always hear things I, I always joke because when I met my teacher Rod was the moment literally my body started falling apart and I think and I look back at that moment and I realize it was the debilit it was the breakdown of my ego and everything I thought yoga was because if I can't do that chaturanga then what is my yoga practice if I can't do that seated forward bend, what is my yoga practice? And that opening was the opening I needed to just be open to hearing what could yoga be for me in my life. So it took me 10 more years to figure it out. And then another 10, <laughs> and another 10. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> The yoga tradition tells us that the mind and breath are twin laws. They travel together. When the mind is calm and clear, the breath flows smoothly. Conversely, when the breath flows smoothly, the mind calms and clears. The condition of one determines the condition of the other. This fundamental law governs life in the material plane. To free the mind from disturbance, stupefaction, and distraction, and allow it to flow inward one pointedly requires understanding the dynamics of our breath and attaining mastery over it. If you take nothing from this training, Please take that statement. <laughs> I'm dead serious. You know, you can throw everything else out that Karina and I teach you. No, I'm serious. Keep that statement. I'll read it again just in case. To free the mind from disturbance, stupefaction, distraction, allow it to flow inward, one pointedly requires understanding the dynamics of our breath and attaining mastery over it. You know, when I was starting to do yoga, I used to say this a lot. And, I, and then I just got sick of it because I thought it became too cliche because everybody else was saying it, of course. <laughs> the yoga is everything of, sorry. The breath is everything about yoga. Yoga is all about the breath. That's what I was trying to say. Yoga is all about the breath. It really is. <clears throat> it truly is. And 
what I started to take from my practice with Rudy and what I try to teach, especially in 300 hour, is this understanding of breath, that everything you need to know is in your breath and that you really can start to become a master of your life when you can start to master your, at the very least, some understanding of breath. And how your breath and how you breathe is intertwined with your pranic force, and your pranic force is directly related to your ability to manifest and make stuff happen. When that is not balanced, Everything else is out of balance. You want to say something? You want to ask or say? Yeah, I have a question. Um, well, what about people with physical conditions that prevent them from controlling their breath? Like, what about asthmatics? <coughs> or I imagine when all of this COVID stuff is over, perhaps we're going to have some people in our classes who have a severe disadvantage to controlling their breath. Damage. Mm -hmm. um, they just have to, it's just harder, like. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want to answer the question too? Um, somebody actually asked a question there, and um, I think Angelo, did you want to say something, Angela, or did you want to ask a quick? Just says, hey, can you double check that this is recording? We're recording through a different system. Yeah, do you just want to double check that quickly? So, I believe it's, it is recording, Angela. We have it recording. I have a backup recording device. And yeah, we just checked it is recording. Um, maybe, Brittany, you can just quickly check the iPhone, too. <laughs> so, <clears throat> okay, let me answer your question. And then I want to tell you a story. So, <clears throat> you don't, to understand prana, you don't need to understand, you don't need to have this, let me say it one way and then I'll come back to your question. It's like, I'm, it's like even if you're paraplegic, you can do yoga. Mm -hmm. Physical limitations don't stop us from getting in touch with our pranic force. Our pranic force is exhibited one way is definitely through the breath. And so understanding, but when PRT is talking about the breath, it's the most um, gross level of understanding our pranic force. But as we start to peel back the layers, we can start to go much deeper. And it's those layers that I want you guys to start paying attention to. Even someone who is asthmatic, will start to be able to peel back the layers of these teachings. And probably, to some degree, I'm not going to say how much, <laughs> will actually, could possibly start to change the momentum of their asthma. My asthma is way better than it was 10 years ago. So Lisa was just saying that her asthma is way better uh, than 10 years ago. Somebody else has a question? You want to unplug it? Maybe Angela wants to say something. <laughs> Speak. Speak, my she goddess. Does. She has words. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer this question probably not quite as eloquently as you just did, but I will give it my best shot because I have been there. Um, a very condensed version of this, you guys. Um, I'm a cardiac patient. I've had six surgeries, and in one of my very first surgeries, um, I actually had the flat line. And when I came out of this, it was in the middle of the night, and I was like, I can't breathe. I'm suffocating. Something's happening. And you know, the team of doctors were around me, and they said something to me that was really pivotal. And I've taken it with me this entire time, but the way that you breathe is one breath at a time. You take one breath in and you take one breath out and that's all you have to worry about in that moment because then the next breath will come and the next breath will come and the next breath will come. And so there were these very long, very long evenings where I was like, no, no, I'm 
I'm all done. I don't want to do this anymore. And so when we have those people that come into our lives who cannot breathe or struggle to breathe, it's sometimes just a good reminder to say, well, you just have to do it one time, just one breath. So that's my, that's my, hey, hey, hey. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Angela. Yeah. So my story is when I was, can you guys hear me? My story is when I um, was working with Rudy, I was in 2006. I was actually going through a very transformational moment in my life. It was really the seed moment of what started to birth Blue Osa. It was at that moment I started thinking like, oh, I really would like to open up a yoga retreat. I would like to, and actually the, the initial idea was to do it in New York City. I really wanted to make a gay men's ashram in New York City. <laughs> I had this utopian idea in my mind. <laughs> and, um, but then, anyway, so then I went to Hawaii and I was leading a yoga retreat. And so I was working with Rudy and then I went to Hawaii and I met Hawaii in two weeks in Hawaii, I taught a teacher training, a retreat, and made four yoga DVDs and a documentary. And it was my understanding and practice of how pranayama should be, or how I needed to practice pranayama to gather as much prana, to hold on to it, and then to intentionally direct it. To this day, still don't know how I did it. <laughs> but I mean, in truth, at this very moment, you know, we're doing an online training. We're running a 200 hour, a 300 hour, and I'm running another 200 hour online teacher training this month. And so it's the ability to pull prana in and focus it. The interesting thing was, after that Hawaii retreat, I came back, I was so balanced. Oh my God, I was so balanced. From leading that experience, but also maintaining my practice all the way through it. I've practiced every single day, very diligently. And um, by the way, part of that practice was relaxation. That a lot of people, and this is why when I, I'm gonna circle back to 61 points a few times. This is going to be the first time, but 61 point relaxation is really the beginning point to unmasking or unveiling the potential of what pranayama can be for you in your life. Because what we're doing in 61 points at so many levels is you're starting to train your mind in the start to move in a very specific pattern. You're also starting to focus your mind. You're starting to learn how to concentrate your mind. So I came back from that experience and I was so balanced. And I remember I had signed up for this, um, it's this thing called body electric. It's for specifically for men, more for gay men, but all men of course are welcome. We don't discriminate. <laughs> and uh, it was really for, it was, a, it, it was a way, body electric, <laughs> says everything you need to know. And it, what they did in this program, it was really hard for me. And then finally I just surrendered and to it because I didn't really want to participate in their breathing practice. But it was this breathing practice that was very similar or had some similarities to Bastrika, but it wasn't. And it, the idea really is to just basically get people to put their finger into an electric socket and wake them up. And people wake up. I mean, they wake up. And it's, it's really is a beautiful thing. I don't want to paint a negative picture of it because it, actually the work that Body Electric has done has been phenomenal. But for me and where I was at in this balanced state, putting my finger into an electric socket, it took me a month to recover my chronic balance after that. I was just like, 
all over the place. I was unfocused. I just, it really disrupted everything. And, and so there again is this idea of yama, of in a very gentle and slow and deliberate way, we're starting to build our prana up in a very safe way. We're building our prana up. And to do it in a gentle way is really important. It's something that I've actually put into my language more and more um, is, you know, hold the breath to your capacity. Don't worry about how, you know, holding it forever. Just hold it to a gentle place so you can start to feel bhavana, that energy starting to build inside of you. Develop a feeling, an inner connection to that prana. Um, so that's just something else I wanted to say. You have another question? Yeah, it's like just about the body electric thing, like psychically, like your finger in a socket, right? It's like some sort of electrotherapy thing. <laughs> Emma's concerned that we really put our, our there was some electrotherapy <laughs> in a body electric. No. no, it was a metaphorical way. But it really is. I mean, I always, and by the way, the electric socket thing, I got that from David Swanson. Because he, 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 you know, said, quoting his teacher, who was also from Texas, Aaron, pranayama is like putting your finger into an electric socket. <laughs> Did I get my Texan accent down okay? <laughs> you all know, that was so far off. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that's where I got that from but it, it really is and you know kundalini yoga is like that if you guys have done kundalini yoga it can be very much like that um, with kundalini there's a little bit more of um, you know, now that I brought it up I have to say something about it um, it's, it's a lot I'm Kundalini yoga is like putting your finger into an electric socket. You know, the people that wear the white turbans and do these, <laughs> you know, practices. But there's a lot of sattva in those practices. There's a lot of mantra. There's a lot of coming back to the divine. There's a lot of coming back to the third eye. So there's a lot of sattva. In this body electric workshop, there was not a lot of sattva. It was just like boom, 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 building, 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 building. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and it's really important to come back to sattva, and, and this is a conversation that we're gonna have because we're gonna have a big talk. Karina's gonna guide you guys through the, the gunas, so that's coming up. Um, it is really important to have sattva, and sattva, and doing practices around sattva is essential for building this kind of idea of yama, this container. What is this container? If, if you in your home, for example, are doing intense pranayama practices, you know, you go from pranayama to watching Fox News and then, um, I don't know, having like five cans of Coke, cola, and, you know, and then going out and partying with your friends, that's not really um, a sattvic environment. Mm -hmm. That's going to, sure, you're going to feel energy from the pranayama. That's, without a doubt, that's going to happen. But where is that prana going afterwards? And, and so this is, always have that in your mind. Where is my prana flowing to? You can get a tattoo. <laughs> where is my front where is my prana flowing where is my intention the two causes of mind consciousness thoughts and energy and the death of one is the death of the other one of the most important ideas about Tantra that you need to understand is where your thoughts go your energy follows and where your energy goes your thoughts go and so that's also ties into this kind of idea of of sattva of being aware constantly of where is my prana flowing. 
Angela, earlier you were talking about mean girls and, you know, and getting frustrated and angry. And then you had this realization, the way that I interpreted your story, that you made a conscious decision of where do I want my energy to flow? Do I want it to flow in being angry and feeling all of these, what I'm going to call right now, negative feelings? Or do I want to put my energy into feeling more positive? That is an example of, you know, where do I want my energy to flow? So, you know, Angela can do these pranayama practices, just to kind of piggyback on your story. You can do these pranayama practices, and if she doesn't resolve those tendencies, Stephanie, coming back to your question, then yes, all of that prana that she's building is going, you know, feeding her frustration and all of her feelings. And she's not only going to feel those things, she's going to powerfully feel those things. You know? And now, because she's made that decision to feel, you know, to channel it differently, she's now powerfully feeling those things. So it's not the energy that's bad or good. You know, the Divine Mother is the Divine Mother. She's going to keep flowing with you, to you. It's up to us what we do with it. <laughs> so that's why they're saying you need the guidance. If you're just by yourself, you might not have that ability to remind yourself of that. Yeah, I... I that caution about practicing without instruction. There's definitely a caution to, there's a lot of cautions in the scriptures about needing a teacher to kind of, kind of guide you. And I would say yes, and I would say no. Like you don't need the dependence of your teacher, but you do need to you know, have people around you that can reflect to you your habit patterns and say, hey, you know, I see you doing this or I see you doing that or I see you putting your energy into being angry all the time. You know, is that really what you want to do? Or I see you putting your energy into being negative. And so, you know, in the Blue Osa 28 day immersion is that opportunity for us to start getting to do some work on ourselves and start noticing our own habit patterns, either through practicing journaling, through watching ourselves, or through this idea of sharing, or sometimes through reflection to each other. And, and so that, you know, here it's an intense version, but it's also having people in your life that can sometimes reflect things to you. That's really critical. And in, in yoga, we call that word, that word is sangha. It's, it's creating sangha, creating compassionate, healthy community, which is a big part of, of, of course, pranayama as well, is having community. We feed off of each other. We build our energy up and we're in a healthy community of people that can do that. I need to move forward in this conversation because I have some scriptures to cover. So, <laughs> um, and I also wanted to finish this idea that <clears throat> the practice, again, I'm still, by the way, in 113. <laughs> if you want to follow along, I'm jumping around though, Lisa, um, but I'm jumping a little bit ahead of where I was. The practice of pranayama enables us to see that our mind is our friend. The mind is benevolent and trainable. Its guiding ability is unfailing. It has a natural tendency to be clear and tranquil and to reflect the total truth of the reality within. We can begin practicing pranayama without knowing much about the dynamics of the pranic forces we are attempting to bring under control, just as we breathe without knowing much about the mysteries of our breath. 
we can manipulate our breathing without knowing much about it. But as soon as we become aware of the flow of our breath, the mind discovers its best friend. And this is what I was trying to say earlier, Emma, about your comment about joking or not, about, oh, there's some things that I just don't want to let go of. That is, after a fashion, being spoken from your place of vasana or your samskaras. That's not being spoken from your, from your highest, from your truest self. But that's being spoken from the vasanas. And there's a part of our mind, and starting to see certain areas of my life, I'm starting to see this too, that I'm really struggling to let go of identities, habit patterns, like there's some clinginess. And what he's saying here is a very powerful statement that when we discover the intrinsic power and inner luminosity within through practicing pranayama, that these things just start to go away. These things that we thought we were clinging to, they just, one day we wake up and we're like, what was I holding on to that for? I don't understand. You know, you probably, as we get older, realize that more and more. <laughs> it's like, look back at our 20-year-old self and go, what was I thinking? <laughs> and, and that sometimes that comes with age and wisdom, but it accelerates much faster as we do pranayama. We're able to let go of things. I would also, by the way, just kind of opine on the fact that as we get older, sometimes we actually do cling more to things. And that's kind of a direction that we can also go. When the mind and breath begin to flow together, all the conditions of abhyasa are met. This is such an important point in this teaching of abhyasa that when I read this, I actually cried <laughs> profusely. Because up until this point, abhyasa to me was always this kind of mystical thing. But what PRT is actually saying here is that when we make conscious efforts in our daily life to breathe and breathe with awareness, that all the conditions of abhyasa are met. When we practice breathing, and what kind of breath are we practicing? Kathy, do you remember? <laughs> one to one, one to one breathing or pure breath, which is what you guys have learned um, or, or relearned in this training. We find ourselves spontaneously investing our energy and attention in retaining the peaceful flow of mind. We are enthralled by the realization that the mind is fully with us rather than with the charms and temptations of the world. You know, Lisa, you're sharing earlier about your feelings and what you walked away from, but you know, what was the pull to bring you here? There's this pull of like, I want more of that. I want more of that taste of freedom, that, that to retain the peaceful flow of mind. I want more of that. And so we start divesting and putting our energy into that endeavor. We told you I was coming back. Oh, I know it. <laughs> I know it wasn't a threat, it was a promise that you were coming back. <laughs> for some, for some students, it is a threat. <laughs> there's, one, there's one particular person that comes to mind that I won't talk about. <laughs> no, but literally on the very last day, she came up to me and said, So you're going to miss us, aren't you? <laughs> Om <laughs> Swaha. <laughs> May I put you into the fire? <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I cut you off, Lisa. <laughs> the mind is neither brooding over the past nor anxious about the future. All causes of disturbances have vanished. The mind is free to focus on whatever it wishes and is fully prepared to enter and retain the state of samadhi. Isn't that beautiful? Like that reading, isn't that beautiful? 
Breath is the access point to the kingdom of immortality within. Think about a great teacher who talked about that a lot. Bring your hands to prayer in front of your heart and pray to your heavenly Father in heaven that resides in the cave of your heart. The greater our lack of awareness and the benevolent intention of the inner divinity the more reason for the mind to become disturbed, stupefied, and distracted. This thinking in our 200 teacher, 200 hour teacher training manual, we talk about um, in Tantra that there is no such thing as evil, but evil is the lack of awareness of the divinity within us, and that when we don't retain that remembrance of our own inner divinity, we can do things that are evil. But evil is the lack or the absence of awareness of that inner divinity. The greater our lack of awareness of the benevolent in intention of the inner divinity, the more reason for the mind to become or to act disturbed, stupefied. I'm going to add the word confused and distracted. We employ the faculties of our mind to feel where and how the breath begins, how it touches the opening of the nostrils, how it travels upward, how it feels when it reaches the bridge of the nose and the corners of the eyes, and finally, and how the subtle energy of the breath reaches the center between the eyebrows and then moves to the forehead and beyond. This is what I was trying to teach you guys the other day when we did Enaloma Viloma Kanashudi. Don't just breathe, but actually start to feel the breath. And Emma, to come back to your question about the asthmatic person, this is the level that you start to bring that person. It's no longer about, you know, it's about becoming aware of the breath. That the breath doesn't start here, it actually starts down here, which is where we're going with this practice, this teaching. That he's now here referencing Sutra 134, 135, and then referencing 249, 250, 251, 252, and 253. That where we're going with this practice is actually starting to feel the most deepest intricacies of this. What is the prana doing? We employ the faculties of the mind. We bring all of our attention to our breath. It's no longer something that we're just <laughs> but that we actually bring all of the faculties of our consciousness to feel where and how the breath begins and how it touches the opening of the nostrils, how it travels upward and how it feels when it reaches the bridge of the nose, the corners of the eyes and finally how the subtle energy of the breath reaches the center of between the eyebrows, and then moves to the forehead and beyond. Once the mind tastes that sweetness, it begins to lose interest in associating itself with disturbing, stupefying, and distracting experiences. It pays no heed to the memories of the past and no longer entertains the anxieties of the future. The charms and the temptations of the world start to lose their power to distract. The mind is free to accompany the flow of the breath. The more it does, the more it gathers the strength to enjoy its pristine state. Sorry? Life goals. <laughs> Life goals. Sure. I mean, it's yeah. It's not instantaneous like that. Is all like it doesn't it. happen right away. It doesn't happen in the moment you start doing it. But I would argue that actually for most people, it can happen if they can be guided to that practice and if they want to be taught the practice. 
I had a friend of mine back when I lived in New York. His name was Jonathan. And he was a young kid. He was like 20, 21 years old. And I started teaching him for a while. And I would teach him and I would watch the lights going on. And then I would also watch them going off really quickly. But I didn't, they didn't, they went off because he turned them off. You know, there was a willful effort for him to stay connected to his pain, to stay connected to, and you've heard me talk about the story of my grandmother and how she stopped talking to my mother. And I think of my grandmother who died not speaking to my mother because she chose to hold on to that pain. So we can reach people, it can happen, but some people just don't want it to happen. Some people just wanna stay, you know, in where they are, and that's okay. I still kept teaching him. <laughs> I still kept teaching him the practices, and as long as he showed up, of course. You know, if he showed up, I kept teaching him. I just think some of us have to keep showing up. For and to this time. day, Jonathan will actually say to me, like, I miss your yoga classes. Like, what is it, 25 years later, he tells me, like, I miss your yoga classes. So, yeah, I had to think about it for a second. Time. <laughs> I did connect to time for a moment. I get into space and time is, like, disappears. And so he, he you know, he has that remembrance. But some people, you know, the that whatever that is is stronger. You know, we can see that in our global theater right now <laughs> of people that choose pain over peace. You know, it's so evident. Question that we always have to come back to is how am I feeding into it? How am I participating? So I'm going to move ahead here and <clears throat> quickly do a time check. 4.02. Pardon? 4.02. 4.02, thank you. <clears throat> Is to jump ahead, I'm gonna actually just put the book down and just speak from my, my memory for a moment. That in Sutra 1, 34 and 135. Oh Lord. Where to start? So Sutra, I think it's Sutra 135. I want to just kind of fact check that because I don't want to say something that's not true in this talk. Yeah, Sutra 134. He actually says in the uh, four chapters on freedom, that we can attain samadhi, we can attain that place of peace by meditating on the breath at the end of exhalation. Transparency is the foundation of a stable mind. A mind drowning in the darkness of the five places, places, ignorance, disturbed, distorted, self-identity, attachment, aversion, and fear is bound to be anxious and fearful. Such a mind loses touch with its natural inner joy. The attitudes of friendliness, compassion, happiness, and non-judgment described in the previous five previous sutra illumine the mind and shield it from ignorance, but this illumination is not powerful enough to dispel the principle of darkness itself. The practice described here picks up where Sutra 133 left off, taking us directly into the brilliance inherent in us, and that brilliance of our essential life force, prana shakti. The pranayama technique described, 
or referred to in the sutra, peels those layers away, awakening the body's innate wisdom and illuminating our mind. It drives away stupefaction and instills the mind with clarity, tranquility, and reinfuses it with the ability to flow peacefully towards the center of consciousness. Prana Shakti is the link between our inner intelligence and the tools, the mind and the body, to use, to uses, to ex, it uses, sorry, to express itself. Prana is the direct manifestation of divine will. What did I say earlier? It's the manifestation of her. And as we do this practice, we connect to her more profoundly. In its compassionate intention to awaken us from the timeless slumber of death. Prana is the life force itself, the very breath of Ishvara. Ishvara. Ishvara is another word for the divine. So that's that divine uh, presence. And so what I'm going to say here, I'm going to leave the sutra at rest for a moment because he really circles back and starts to discuss it in the next um, chapter uh, when we start getting into the eight limb path. And the other day, we had a huge conversation about asana. <clears throat> And I kind of started to open this doorway to the possibility that what pranayama at its core, or one of the ideas at its core, I say that a lot, but one of the ideas at its core is it's doing is opening us up to limitless possibilities. Again, using this dance, it was so perfectly timed. It really, it wasn't, we didn't intentionally throw it in. It was so spontaneous. But that's what happens when you open yourself up to pranayama. <laughs> Spontaneity just fills in. But as we were dancing today and getting our prana on, you guys started to disassociate yourself from your pain, from all of those things that were kind of dragging you down, and started becoming inspired and energized and focused. That's the gift and that we start to open ourselves up to limitless possibilities. In that moment, there is a connection to the infinite. That's what we're looking to do in these practices of Tantra, is, is how do we go outside of ourselves, tap into that sense of infinite, infinity, infinite possibilities. I would say to you guys, leaving here, as you leave here in three weeks, three, three and a bit weeks, that ask yourself, four weeks, sorry, three weeks, that you start holding that as one of the bars of your yoga practices. How can I get students to start tapping into the universe of infinite possibilities, to awaken that within themselves? So that is the practice in asana is that your practice in asana should be ultimately getting you to to open up to that universe of infinite possibilities, that your body becomes like the vast expanse of sky. As you start to cultivate that, we can now start to go into pranayama. In sutra, I brought my second sutra book here, because I wanted to read it um, verbatim. <clears throat> Let's see. Sutra 249. Complete mastery over the roaming tendencies of inhalation and exhalation is pranayama. to be practiced only after mastering asana. And so it's not mastering the posture. Yeah, it's a, this is a common mistake. Like you have to get your handstand perfect or your triangle pose perfect. Like 
Now, we're not talking about that at all. What do you think we're talking about primarily when we're talking about mastery over asana? I mean, taking aside everything that I just said about yes. practicing asana, what are, we real, what, are, what are we really referring to when we're talking about mastery and asana? Stability. Stability, stability, stability. Tattoo that on the other leg <laughs> or other arm or another body part. It's always stability. If you don't have stability, you have nothing. Let's bring it back to this idea of yama. There's this container. If that container isn't strong, and let's just kind of say right out of the bat, right out of the gate, that people's yamas, people's containers, people are not strong. And so you get them doing these pranayama practices and they're like, because <laughs> that energy is going everywhere. And it's just, it's not directed, it's not focused. So this, there has to be stability. If that container is not strong, then it just goes all over the place. So whenever we're talking about mastery and asana, it's really weird to me because Mr. Angar was once asked, why don't you practice or teach pranayama? And he said, because I haven't mastered asana yet. And it's just like the weirdest thing. But kind of knowing I, <clears throat> kind of knowing some of those people, that there's a lot of instability. <laughs> no, there really is. <laughs> there's a lot of instability. We have, a, we have a few anger groups that come here, and it's just interesting. But one of them in particular, I mean, they get here, and they're like, you know, they're like ping pong balls bouncing around. Like, we don't have this. We don't have that. What about this? What about that? There was a person that yelled at Michael one night because she didn't have, I guess she didn't have the food that she was going to be expecting to have or something. And she turned to the teacher and screamed really loud, Michael's trying to kill me. <laughs> My judgments aside, <laughs> that is a clear example of instability. That's a real clear example of, of a mind, a mind that's not stable. And so we want to bring stability to them. Uh, we want to bring stability to that person. So, <clears throat> when, when Patanjali is talking about this, he's saying we need to get stable. And then, once we get stable, we can start to feel that infinite space within us. When we start tapping into that infinite space, we've mastered asana. We've reached the, the mastery of asana. So, in Sutra 2, um, 48, so that was, two, sorry, 249, and 250, this is where it kind of gets interesting. And this is a really, God, I read this, like I can't tell you how many times, it wasn't until Rod explained it to me, did it all make sense. And this was the game changer. That pranayama, with breath retention, could be, is threefold. It's external, It's internal. And it's also when it stops. So when the breath rate stops, when the breath stops. It is monitored by space, by time and number. So that's the practice right there. It's internal, external, sorry, I did that first. External, it can be internal, and where is it stopped? It's really not so much that it's stopped, it's where does it stop? Oh, is that, okay, is that what you were saying in the other sutra where it's like focused on the end of the exhalation? That yes, that's sense? also tied into it too. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> which I'm gonna get to in just a moment. <laughs> Each is monitored by space. 
This idea of space is kind of relating back to, is it external or is it internal? And where is it? Where is the space that the prana is? By time, so you, how long are you doing it for? And by number. I'm going to come back to that teaching because that's like the whole enchilada. This is like everything that you need to know. This ties into our morning practice. It ties into a big talk that Karina is going to give to you guys on Pranadharna. So uh, it, it's the seed of everything that you need to know is in this teaching I'm going to give you. But in that sutra, sorry. And the fourth pranayama transcends the domains of external and internal. Woo! I mean, the fourth, the fourth kind of pranayama is that which even goes beyond. Some of you guys know this about me. I love to hike. This is one way I can explain the sutra to you. I love hiking. I love being outdoors. Some people, they come outdoors and say, let's go hiking. How long is it going to be? How high are we going to go? I'm going to die. First of all, just take note, where is their mind flowing? <laughs> where is their mind flowing? I led this, um, one of my most incredible trips to India happened the year I broke my leg. But <clears throat> what actually happened before that was really, um, really, really profound. And actually what happened two months before that was also profound, but that's another story for another day. But when I brought this group with me to India, I kind of brought them on two e enormous hikes. One of them I had done, and so I knew what was coming up. The other one I had never done. And I remember thinking to myself, there was a moment when we were like three quarters of the way up this mountain and I had a, like an oh shit moment. Where have I brought these people? <laughs> and there was these guys that were coming. It was actually all men. And there was, remember there was this tall guy and to this day I don't remember his name. But he was like a tall guy, like six foot six. Big guy. Like, not like overweight big, just big and stocky and, you know, seemingly in shape. And I had been sending emails to these people months beforehand, like, please go to the gym, please work out, you know, get a trainer if you need to, start improving yourselves. And it was very clear to me on that trip who heeded my advice and didn't. Actually, one of the people, his name is Brian Gorman, He's done a lot of photography for me and become one of my dearest friends. And at that time, he was around the age of, I want to say 60. And he's actually said to me like that night, he says, you told me I needed to get a personal trainer. I got a personal trainer and I, I knew that he did because I knew that this moment, I was going to be preparing for this moment and thank God I did. <laughs> But it was fascinating to watch myself and to watch the people who really succeeded in doing those hikes and the people who didn't. And the people who succeeded in hiking, you know this from your experiences, that are the people that are able to do one thing that nobody else can do. The people who are suffering don't do this. The people who are doing well do do this. They start to become one with nature. They start tapping into the prana that's the living prana around them. Their prana and the outside prana becomes one. I know that sounds hokey, but that is the sutra. Is that when you no longer differentiate and you no longer see limitations, that you become that prana that is outside of you. Or you, another way of saying that is that you actually start to feed on that prana and that you also feed that prana, that it becomes circulatory. That that fourth state is really when you're able to become that prana in the universe.
Now remember that we're setting up for meditation. It's kind of important to come back to context once in a while. <laughs> this is the eight limb path, you know, and this is only the fourth rung on the ladder, you know, we have four more rungs to go. <laughs> But that is, for me, that realization, when I had that realization, and I don't know that it's something that you can teach, it's something that you have to experience. I do my best to give you that experience, and my mind is emptying my body like the vast expense of sky. And there's other ways that will do it, but when you start to have that experience that your prana is the same as that tree, and that ocean, and those noisy, belligerent taxi drivers, cabs, in New York City, because my studio is right on the corner of 6th Avenue and 23rd Street. When you start to realize that you are actually one with all of that, there's a certain equanimity and resilience that arises out of that place. It's no different. So that's Sutra 251, and then 252 says, <clears throat> oh my God. This is a beautiful teaching. It actually kind of relates to what I just said. That when you realize that your prana is no different, that when you start to merge with that prana in the universe, what I said earlier, just a moment ago, is that you have this realization, and that's Sutra, <laughs> Sutra 252, which says, almost verbatim, the covering of light disappears. The covering of light disappears. And that covering of light means a few things, but one of the things that the covering, the lid, that physical lid that's covering your light, that's stopping you from shining brightly in the world, is a video. That's really what the covering that you're referring to is. Within us, we have this light, and there's something that's covering that light. Remember the light of knowledge, the light of self. That covering is really a video. When you start tapping into prana, when you start to become one with that prana, that all of that ignorance just disappears. That sense of not knowing this. And you have knowledge. And he actually kind of talks a little bit about this in Sutra 120, that what starts to actually manifest is pragnia. Pragnia is this idea of that your, your intuition, your sense of Oh my God, there's the universe. I see it. And then you stop doing yoga, or your mind stops doing yoga, or you're experiencing yoga, and then the covering comes back. <laughs> what was that? That just happened. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> then you go back to your life. <laughs> but that's Sutra 252. Emma, did you want to ask for something? Oh, I just. Um, when you said the covering of life, I, I, mean, I thought like being a light or something, not the light that's being covered. So, the covering of yeah. the light, that there's a covering over this light, there's a lid over this light. Yes. Yeah. It's a moment of recognition. Yeah. <clears throat> and then Sutra 253 says the mind is qualified or ready. For concentration. In, in actually in the four, four chapters on freedom, it says, then the mind is actually fit for concentration. Every time I see that word, I think of like, <clears throat> you know, a boxer that's training for a match. The boxer is fit. The mind is fit. We need to exercise the mind. And I know some of you will hate me for saying this, but I'm going to tie it back to 61 point relaxation again. And the reason why you're going to hate me is because some of you just go to sleep and you have a very weak mind. <laughs> Your mind is not fit for concentration. <laughs> that you, <laughs> you are a lazy yogi. Um, that 
this is like really key here. Oh my God. Okay. So there's so many things going on here, but one, you're starting to train your mind how to relax in a, sorry, scrap what I just said. You're trying to teach your mind how to concentrate in a relaxed state. Your tendency to go to sleep is directly related to our conditioning in what we do when we relax. So many of us have an aversion to relaxing because what is relaxing? Relaxing means sleep time. And so anytime we start feeling relaxed, oh my God, it's not safe. I have to drink some coffee. I have to drink, you know, stimulate myself, take some pills. I have to make myself busy. It's not okay to relax because when we relax, we go to sleep. And so you see this all the time with people in yoga, that it's really hard for them to stay aware, to stay present, to keep that part of their mind concentrated on what they're doing because the tendency, like I said, is like they go to sleep. Just like Destiny. Destiny relaxes, she's out like a light. <laughs> The work in relaxation is starting to train your mind to concentrate in a relaxed state, to keep it present. And I, I, I want to just say, I hope we're still friends. <laughs> I hope we're still friends. Because, you know, at the same time, I don't want you guys to beat yourselves up for falling asleep. You know, don't, don't beat yourselves up, but know that you're working towards also having an intention of staying present. You know, in Karina, when she led um, Yoga Nidra, some of you might not remember this because you're probably already asleep, um, that she said at the very beginning, I'm going to practice Yoga Nidra. I'm going to stay awake and practice Yoga Nidra. And it really is tied into, again, Yama this container of setting an intention, part of the container, part of that container is really setting an intention on what you're doing. If you can do that, then you can stay much, you can stay focused much more effortlessly. Something to put a pin in, because you know, like if you wake up in the morning and go, oh shit, I gotta wake up this morning, go to practice. God damn it, I don't wanna be here. I don't want to do this. It what makes, am I doing? It makes me think of training for endurance sports. A guy that I did long distance cycling for many years. And for me, the breath and relaxing my body was so important to be able to actually complete the distance. And Steph probably has the same experience from yeah. running. That you, you really, and this is how I, when I would teach um, trainings for certain events, like I would definitely teach breath work as part of that training and, and how to relax your shoulders, how to relax your body, and just sort of be in the, the be in it for the long haul. That's the only way you can go the distance is to, is, and to stay concentrated on what, what you're doing and not let your mind go into the pain or the discomfort are all over the place, is yeah. to, to relax your body and to concentrate on the breath. Yeah. Lisa was just saying that there's a correlation between her endurance training for running and, um, and doing that. Can I just ask you guys one little favor? Like, if it's a quick question, you don't need to do this, but if you're gonna give a long question or, or something, just ask me for the mic so that they can hear you. <laughs> That's okay, it's okay. It's totally, it's totally fine. Um, so, <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, it's the same principles apply to, this principle is not unique just to yoga. I mean, it's anything to do with starting to train the mind um, and focus the mind on one singular thing. <clears throat> I mean, one of the things that, I think kind of the ahas I had was one, one statement that PRT made one time that, <clears throat> Oh, 
there's very little in our culture, I think I said this the other day, there's very little in our culture to train the mind. There's very little like awareness in, okay, let's discipline and focus our mind. And, but there are some areas that that happens and, and you know, doing things like what you just described in, in, in doing endurance training, it's a very powerful tech way to exercise the mind. Um, and it's also the same principle that's applied to training people who are in the medical field, especially doctors, specialists. They have to be constantly um, exercising that part of their mind to the point where they actually kind of practice yoga nidra. You know, you hear about these people that do 60 hour shifts, you know, and they sneak away for 15 minutes and, you know, close their eyes and train themselves how to become perfectly relaxed and, and, go into that place. And that, that is exercising the full potential of your mind. You have to do that. I mean, doctors are very extraordinary people, what they go through. So that is, the, that, is that sutra. And then in Sutra 254, he says, lacking contact with the respective objects when senses assume the net nature of the mind, it is pratihara. Basically what he's saying is that when we fully immerse into that state, the state of prana, when we're able to take our mind and completely merge it with prana, that we experience complete sensory withdrawal. Probably, I'm assuming already you guys have had that experience of I don't know, Alex is outside chopping down trees. Sometimes there's their wind blowing something. Sometimes the generator is going in the background. You know, there's cars that are going. And then you're doing your practice. And then all of a sudden, there's all this noise and it goes It's like someone turned the volume off outside. And at that moment, you're completely immersed inside until something pulls you out of that. You know, the teacher says, okay, take a deep breath. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> no, I don't want to leave here. <laughs> I want to stay here. Have you guys had that experience? Yes. You guys have had that experience. You know what I'm talking about. That That is what he's saying here in Sutra 254, that when we arrive at that place, we're able to completely move inwards. So... I'm going to, I think, um, I'm going to put a pin in Sutra 251 for now, and I'll come back to it. Um, I know tomorrow morning, um, I think Karina wanted to do the moon practice with you. I'm going to see if I can finish this teaching with you tomorrow morning, um, and, um, and then do a quick little meditation practice, and then let Karina do her moon practice with you afterwards. Oh, Halloween. Hello? And it's full moon tomorrow. <laughs> so, so get you guys online, you don't want to miss this. Um, Brittany, can you actually send every, no, 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 no. Can you remember to send everybody a WhatsApp and um, just tell them to get their ass to yoga class tomorrow morning? They don't have to come for the blah, 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 but they should come for the yada, yada, yada. <laughs> And so, <laughs> I'll do the blah, blah, blah. I'll tell Karina I'm going to do a little blah, blah, blah tomorrow. What's blah, blah, blah? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. What if... <laughs> you know, I always poke fun at myself because um, one of my students who I had this huge affinity for, um, his name was Job, and one day he came up to me and he says, what time is yoga? And I said, 8 o'clock. He goes... What time are you going to finish the Yammerin? Because <laughs> I want to go for a walk, and I was thinking of coming after the Yammerin part. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we still laugh about that. <laughs> he had a way with words. He's a very particular way with words. I always, I always, we knew how to tickle each other's funny bones. Um, before we close up 
this, I'll come back to how to practice pranayama. It's a very specific practice. I'll either do it tomorrow morning or another time. Um, but before I ask that, everything Karina and I do, and really started this morning in bandhas, was, is going to be all about how to harness this energy, how to merge with that energy, and how to start directing it for your practice. And there's a lot to pranayama, there's a lot to everything that I just talked about that's related to ritual. If you want to feed your rituals, if you want to bring your rituals to life, all of it is connected to prana. All of it's connected to prana. So, um, you guys have any questions before we finish? Yes? How do you know when you are being lazy in your like concentration during relaxation and when you just like genuinely need a nap? <laughs> <laughs> So the question from Emma was, how do you know when you are being lazy and you should concentrate your mind versus when you really need to take a nap? You know, I, I think, and I, I'm kind of basing this on my own sort of understanding of the scriptures and then my own experience. And what I would say is that your desire to check out is in, in and of itself is a tamazic quality of mind where we're wanting to avoid or or that we're wanting to avoid something <clears throat> sleep in and of itself is a tamazic kind of practice you know And I say this, I'm, I'm saying this not from the place of don't beat yourself up over it, you know, like, like it's a, it's a step-by-step -step process. I've been working on yoga nidra practices for 10 years and I'm still working on it. <laughs> okay. So, you know, remember that as I'm, as I'm talking. Um, but you know, like you can fully relax and be conscious. And I always equate it to this idea of like when you're in the car going on a road trip and your friend is driving and then you were driving and then you get in the passenger seat and you just like conk out. But there's still a part of you that's like listening to the radio because they're playing the radio and probably had the music down a bit. But you, or maybe you're in the car with two friends and they're talking quietly, but they're still talking and you're still conscious of hearing them, but yet you're still sleeping, you're still relaxing, you're still resting. And I think it's that for me is the kind of one of the equivalencies that we're talking about, that there's a part of your mind to start becoming a part of that part of your mind that is awake, that is conscious, because the fact of the matter is that part of your mind is always awake. But that tendency to like, oh, I want to go to sleep. It's kind of like, you know, it is lazy and it is like, I just want to check out. And it's also a part of your mind. It's an aspect of my mind that isn't fully trained yet. And what we're seeking to do in yoga is train that part of our mind. So that, you know, in, in kind of something to throw into the mix of this whole conversation is that yogis looked at sleep time as the moment to do our deepest work is the moment that in that time at night when we go to sleep is when the mind really starts to reveal itself we get the chance to see our samskaras i told you guys the story the other day of somebody trying to kill me oh i didn't tell you i told my online group that story <laughs> i got mixed up here <laughs> I had this bizarre dream where somebody was trying to kill me. This assassin had been sent to kill Yogi Aaron. And this, it was such a vivid dream that left such a samskara on me. Oh my God. And so there's a part of me that's like, okay, what's going on here? And, and I was trying, and I actually kind of remember myself going through that, like, 
being kind of aware of like what's going on here and working on resolving whatever was surfacing in that moment. That is the time when we can really do our deepest work. Having said that, some of us are still a long way off of that. <laughs> so with all the fullest compassion, you know, that I can muster, try to practice being more concentrated. <laughs> 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 But understand that, you know, we're still human and we still are, you know, working on it. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? No? Nothing? You understand all the mysteries of the universe? <laughs> Leslie. Well, we'll say goodbye then. We'll see you guys tomorrow morning. Have a good and super wonderful night. Thank you guys for being here. And um, I hope this was a good talk for you guys. So, finish tomorrow. Namaste. Huh? Namaste. <laughs> Namaste, bad. Namaste, bad. Namaste, bad. Namaste, bad. Namaste, bad. Namaste, bad. Namaste, bad.